All right. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. And again, thanks to, uh, to Lenny for uh, putting on this meeting and, and having this meeting and for inviting me. Uh, it left me with a bit of a challenge uh, for this topic because uh, it's new and uh, emerging agents. But in rheumatoid arthritis, he, ha he had Mike Weinblatt give a talk on the new Jack and the new Sick, and then he had an entire talk on uh, the, the kinome uh, and individual talks on all the topics. So I kind of cheated a little bit and changed this to new and emerging agents and trends. And I think that hopefully it'll have your interest as I think some of the exciting new aspects of how we bring developments to the patients relate to trends in our use of the medications as much as the individual medications themselves. Uh, disclosure is the same as yesterday, although uh, after last night's dinner at Primo Vino, where there was a lot of wine, there was a discussion about eggplant, I may have one less tomorrow, but we'll see. Um, so where are we in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, and it's interesting, it's, it's fascinating talks today across disciplines, and I think there's a lot of shared agents, and I think we'll see a lot of shared therapeutic approaches and things that we look forward to in the future. So we have available to us the oral agents, the traditional DMARD, the new DMARD, the biologic agents, of course, the most experienced with the TNF inhibitors, uh, other approved biologics you've heard a lot about, and then for experimental emerging therapies. I spoke yesterday about additional IL-6 inhibitors. We heard a lot about B cells, both by Richie today and, and by Greg Silverman yesterday. Uh, still interest in the kinase inhibitors. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, the IL-1223 won't talk about in specifically in rheumatoid arthritis, but we'll talk a little bit about IL-17 and then just a word on biosimilars. So let's start with the TNF inhibitors. I think it's fascinating to hear across GI and dermatology and rheumatology uh, how dramatically they have affected our approach to patients. And they've really raised the bar. And now, and certainly in, in rheumatology, we're, we're talking about remission and fighting over how do you best define remission. Can you be in remission if you have ultrasound power Doppler signal, but the joints don't feel inflamed? So that's a great discussion. Uh, and I think the important aspect of this is that the, the success we've had, particularly with the TNF inhibitors, has not only raise the bar, but, it, but it's really driven success in treatment approaches as well. So I think it's highlighted the uh, approach using traditional DMARDs in ways that we didn't used to before because now we know we can do better, so we want to do better. So where are we with TNF inhibitors? And I've cut this down from the list that you'll see in the handout that you have just to a couple of the points that I like to, to highlight. Uh, most patients respond, but some don't. Some go into remission. Some come in, and that's the response we live for. The patient who comes in the office the next week and says, Doc, I feel great in ways I didn't know I felt bad. Uh, and then there are some people who don't do well. Uh, and I think it, it's one of the things that I think is a tremendous challenge and an important aspect of the research agenda is we don't know who. We can't tell before treating patients who is going to go into remission, who's going to not respond, or who's going to have some side effect. Uh, Mostly, we have to continue treatment. That's the second bullet point. We have to usually continue treatment, although there's some exciting interest now in can we adopt, like our oncology colleagues, more of an induction and consolidation approach where maybe we can stop therapy. Can we do this better in earlier disease than in later disease? A lot of interest in that. TNF inhibitors, as we've already heard from some great discussions by Dr. Plevy, uh, great in GI as well, and in other diseases also, but they're not a cure-all. They don't work in everything. And I put those two bullets up there because things that somehow make a lot of sense uh, well, don't always work out. If they did, IL-1 would be every bit as good as TNF because 15, 20 years ago, um, I'm, wow, I'm dating myself now. I, the, the other thing that dated me was during Richie Fury's talk, I recognized all the song titles he had. These younger people in the back row, they're like, what the heck was on his slides? What is this the end business? Um, but you have the TNF inhibitors. 20 years ago, IL-1 should have been every bit as good. And I think that's relevant when we talk about kinase inhibitors. Things that make a lot of sense sometimes don't make sense. And we don't always know why. Sometimes we do figure out years later. So I think this takes us to a concept for the TNF inhibitors. How come we can't pick who is going to go into remission with the TNF inhibitor? And this gets the idea of personalized medicine. Of course, this sounds great. 
If we could personalize medicine, you go to the doctor, you get a pill with your name on it, you walk in the door, and maybe they scrape the DNA out of your cheek, you leave with a pill that's just meant for you. That would be awesome. We could predict responses, and we could individualize. The, as as pe many people have said, the most expensive drug is the drug that doesn't work. And if we could obviate that, that would be fantastic. But personalized medicine, at least to me, as a rheumatologist, uh, it's the Cubs. It's the Cubs, I should clarify, in April. In April, they're in first place before the season starts. Every year, they are going to win the World Series. Every year. And what happens? Well, not so much. And I think that's the way personalized medicine has been in rheumatology. Um, and what, why is that? And how come we're in distinction to what we see in other fields, particularly in oncology? Um, it's a hot area. I think all of us, I know I do, if I get a issue of arthritis and rheumatism. This one came late last year, and I look at the titles, and you flip through, and there's a lot of mouse stuff, and you go, predicting responses to TNF inhibitors. And you go right to the page, and you look at it, and this is a, a very well-done article. It's done from the group in Newcastle. is a, a, uh, a, a big center for doing this. John Isaacs, uh, uh, of course, one of the great researchers. Uh, and what they found was that there was a particular SNP uh, that was associated with improvement, and to their credit, what they did was actually validate this. So, as Yogi Berra always says, as, uh, said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Uh, and most studies of biomarkers or personalized medicine and rheumatology predict the past. And uh, then you have to say, can you predict the future? Now, and they did. But this is one of the big issues in personalized medicine. If you look at the change in the DAS score, you can see the asterisks show that this is statistically significant. So if you, depending on how many copies of this SNP you have, you may have a lesser response. But you look at the magnitude, and that's far, far, far below anything that's going to be useful to us in the clinic next Monday with the next patient that you comes in to see. Well, it's interesting because the public has a sense of, of personalized medicine. It sounds great. How come we're not doing it? And there are successes. But I think most, to me, most of this comes in cancer. I think it's mostly related to the fact that uh, at least some cancers are, are more understandable as single genetic defects. So uh, if you look, for example, at uh, KRAS mutations. So if you look at therapies that are based on EGFR, EGFR signals through KRAS. There are mutations in KRAS signaling protein such that it's constitutionally active. So blocking something back upstream of that doesn't matter. And indeed, if you look at EGFR-based therapies that uh, do or don't work well in colon cancer, what you see in the, that the, the forest plot uh, shows that if you don't have the mutation, the therapy works. If you do, therapies don't work. It makes a lot of sense. And it's gotten to be where if you look at the presence or absence of oncogenes, that you can predict treatment responses with some kinase inhibitors to a really high degree. That's what we need by personalized medicine. We just don't have that yet. Our colleagues in oncology, I think, are way ahead of us in that. Uh, you can get kits now for looking at KRAS mutations. You can actually send cancers for to look for oncogenes. In some cases, things that don't even make sense. So the estrogen receptor abnormality is being found in pancreatic cancer, but that, that's personalized medicine. I don't think we have that yet in rheumatology. Just as kind of a, a crazy aside, this is personalized medicine. So this is in a journal none of us read regularly. I saw this uh, reproduced someplace else and went and looked at it. Um, the guy that you see right there, the little stick figure, is actually the PI of the lab. And it, what they did was they followed him. He had a family history of diabetes, so they followed him over time. He got two respiratory infections, and they did pretty much everything. They, they called it the Integrated Personal Omics, or IPOP. Genomics, transcurinomics, proteomics, metabolomics, autoantibody profiles. And they did this, uh, the 20 different time points over 14 months, did trillions of measurements. And what they found out is that they could really track when he developed glucose intolerance. He's a healthy, thin guy, family history of diabetes, developed glucose intolerance after these infections. And what they found is that they could actually do this. Now, of course, the interesting part, which in the article, which I didn't see in any of the reviews of the article, was there's also a family history of a hematologic malignancy. And he didn't develop that, or has not developed that, but neither did his mother. And his mother did have diabetes, so they could have just asked his mother what she had, and they probably would have gotten close to about the same information. But this is kind of like one extreme of personalized medicine. 
What about us in rheumatology? Well, I don't know that we will have that. This is, a, I think, a lovely article over a decade old now from Ron van Vollenhofen, looking at those patients that they have, RA patients treated in their clinic with TNF inhibitors. And what do you see? Well, I, I just did this when I started the talk. I talked remission, no remission. Response, no response. But that's not reality. In reality, it's a, it's a spread which speaks to the heterogeneity of the disease. It's multifactorial. Certainly, it's multigenetic. And there are good responders, less good responders, middle responders, all the way to no responders. So uh, in, it's not digital. It's more analog. And I think that shows that it's heterogeneity, but also means that it's going to be difficult to predict. Well, something else that might fit within personalized medicine, and this is something that uh, Dr. Keystone spoke about yesterday, and this is something that our GI colleagues are using much more than we are in rheumatology, and that is, it, can you look at levels of antibodies to our agents and the levels of the agents themselves to help predict response? So I think the answer is yes and no. So no matter how much TNF inhibitor you give, some people are not going to respond. But in those patients who have a transient response or fluctuating levels of response, this might be something that we could potentially use. We know the, the, in, the interaction of BMI, the interaction of other drugs like methotrexate can common administration affect these levels. I think this is something we might be seeing more of. I mean, I think at the panel, maybe we'll talk with Dr. Plevy to see, because our GI colleagues are indeed, I think, adopting this much much faster than we have. Um, other thing about TNF inhibitors, and one of the things that I think speaks to the idea of responses is, what are we measuring? So um, this looks at SPECT, uh, bold signals, blood oxygen level dependent signals on a SPECT scan. Uh, the point of this is that when people do well with the TNF inhibitor, they feel better. You know, those patients who call you up the next day and they're dancing, you bring them in in a week and their joints are better, but they're still swollen. Their sed rate was 60, now it's 40. You think they're getting better, but they feel fantastic. And I think that shows, work like this shows us that we're not capturing all of the outcomes that are relevant to our patients. So the feel-good part of it is probably a direct effect. And we know from work actually done at UCSD uh, by Gary Firestein in collaboration with some of the pain folks that TNF is an important pain mediator centrally. And that may be one of the important aspects to our patients. So as we think about new therapies, I think we still have to push and say, what is it we're measuring? Are we capturing all the results? Um, biosimilars. Biosimilars, uh, Jonathan Kay gave a lecture on this at one of the previous summits. It's a whole lecture in and of itself. But when you talk about new therapies, uh, we, we naturally we want to talk about junk inhibitors and jack inhibitors, but biosimilars are out there. They're coming. It's just a question of which ones and when. And they're not going to be new, so new, because there'll be copies of things that we're familiar with. But I think it is, they are emerging, and they will have a decided effect on how all of us practice uh, across disciplines, particularly in rheumatology. So emerging and future therapies, different ways to think about this. This is a, 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 uh, a thing I, I swiped from, I forget which pharma company, someplace along the line, which shows things that might be coming. Uh, and some of it's uh, inaccurate because it's from last year. But one way to look at newer therapies is when might they be coming in relation to the, the clinic. Uh, as you talk to people and they say, hey, what's new, what's coming in rheumatology, the things that are most important to us, the clinicians, are things that we might see at some point. Sure, uh, blocking a, a chemokine that was just discovered last week, in theory, sounds fantastic, but if you don't have any preliminary data, it's hard to get excited about it. But there's a lot of things that are coming. Most of the things that are going to be close are things that are similar to what we have. So additional inhibitors of IL-6, maybe additional B-cell-directed therapies, additional T-cell-directed therapies. But what about from an immunology standpoint? So the immunopathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis, lots of potential targets. That's always been the case. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. So if you look at a, a, a schema such as this, of course, we've had great results, great success with different aspects of this. A lot of that directed against the inflammatory mediators, such as the cytokines and chemokines. But there's always been lots of potential targets. Different ways that you can look at this, looking at more at a mechanistic standpoint, the cells that are involved and what targets are there that could be viable. Now, there's tons of targets, as we see. There's many uh, individual aspects of the dysregulated immune system 
that would be perfectly viable targets in rheumatoid arthritis. The challenge is to know which, one is, which ones are going to be uh, things that emerge. As I said, the biggest, clearest example, is, we don't know. We, 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 uh, we think about the immune system, we draw a diagram like this, and you plug in rheumatoid arthritis, and you draw that old John Madden thing, boom. And there it is, we cure rheumatoid arthritis by blocking something. And it makes sense, but it doesn't always work out that way uh, in real life. Uh, think another way to look at it, what about categories of things that we can look at? Antipsychotics will come back to, the kinases will come back to a little bit, because there's been a ton of data on that, and you've heard some of that here. And I think, in, in essence, we just, sometimes we don't know, or in some cases we don't know why things didn't work. And I, I think that's relevant. Um, Cell trafficking is fascinating to, to, uh, to hear the different specialties talk about this. In, in rheumatoid arthritis, it's really been incredibly disappointing. The clinical results with inhibiting uh, adhesion molecules have been dis disappointing. The clinical results inhibiting chemokines have been very disappointing. As you heard Scott say, uh, early on it seemed like this was really going to be a very good approach because you take the uh, adhesion molecules, the uh, chemokines, which are differentially ex expressed in affected versus normal tissue. You may even think of disease-specific expressions, and you might target something that would then leave aside the unaffected aspects of the immune system. So it made great sense. And actually, from a personal standpoint, many years ago when I was in the lab, my work was on adhesion molecules, and it made great sense. And yet what we've seen is what these have been looked at in rheumatoid arthritis, including the leukocyte integrins particularly, also including the chemokines. It's been really very solidly negative results. A little bit different than we've seen in neurology and, and also in gastroenterology. B cell therapies we've talked a lot about, and T cell therapies we've heard just a, 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 a wonderful lecture on oncology, and we heard about this yesterday also from Dr. Rudiman. Um, interest in the different T cell subsets, and that's a, a potentially emerging area. So uh, a particularly hot, maybe last year's uh, T cell subset of the year, if there was such a prize, would be the TH17 uh, cells which secrete IL-17. Uh, there have been a, a lot of interest in that. And always as we think about potential targets, you have sort of a body of data that says, could this be involved? animal data, uh, and the animal data is great, it's right half the time, and the mice never tell you which half is correct. Then you look in human tissue and say, well, is there an overexpression of a particular potential target? With IL-17, uh, you could make a case for the, its role in the overexpression of the synovium of rheumatoid arthritis patients, overexpressed in psoriatic arthritis joints, certainly overexpressed in psoriatic skin. Well, let's, let's go on that and see what we have for that. The IL-17, uh, you heard this as an introduction. It's interesting because it raises the idea of how to target. You think back 15 years ago, and we said we have anti-TNF-alpha specific monoclonal antibodies versus soluble receptors, which at the very least block TNF-alpha and TNF-beta. Are they going to be different? Are there going to be differences in efficacy and safety? It doesn't appear so now. And you see this also with IL-17. So the agents that you've already heard about, there are uh, two anti-IL-17A uh, cytokine monoclonal antibodies, cecukinumab and ixekizumab. Then there's the IL-17 receptor, a little bit confusing because it's also the A aspect of the receptor, the IL-17RA, berdalimab. But that has a, a broader range. So in theory, you could say that targeting different aspects of it might give differential efficacy and safety. We just don't know that as of yet. You've heard about the, the fantastic results. Our dermatology colleagues are giddy talking about ACR 110, which means that your psoriasis is gone and the person next to you had 10% improvement in their psoriasis. That's how good these things are. Um, what about in rheumatoid arthritis? Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, spectacularly negative results, I would say. This is the data from bridalumab. Uh, the placebo response, different doses of bridalumab. You can make a lot of uh, scenarios for this. Is it a dosing? Was it the group of patients? But when you have 
passing 100s in people in one disease and just absolutely nothing in another disease. I think this tells us something about the pathophysiology of the diseases being different. As you heard Dr. Pubby say, also in gastroenterology, uh, negative results. And I think this is really, this is going to be fascinating. There's not a lot of data publicly about uh, uh, IL-17 blockade in psoriatic arthritis. So it, which is it going to be? Is it going to behave like psoriasis with uh, fantastic results? Rheumatoid arthritis at very low results. The preliminary data was a small study published in ARD in psoriatic arthritis showed that it, was, it had some effect, um, but it was modest. It was m more like what we see with the eustachinumab responses in psoriatic arthritis. Solid, some people did well, but modest responses. But that was preliminary, and we'll have to see. Rheumatoid arthritis, though, it's hard to imagine uh, why this would be a viable target going forward. Um, back to the, the kinases. So you've had fantastic introductions uh, about the kinases and, and the kinase inhibitors. Uh, and the one thing for sure about inhibiting kinases, they make great slides. You can make all sorts of diagrams. And you see here that we've had macromolecules, but then we have uh, inhibitors of transcription or translation. That's always been the promise of inhibiting kinases, that they would have the uh, several viable properties, including oral availability, reduced cost, uh, and potentially differential effects that were more in tune with the abnormalities in our diseases. So here's another uh, pretty picture, uh, and we'll talk about some of these. I think it was is interesting. We kind of talked a little bit yesterday about the monogen-activated protein kinases, or the MAP kinases. And there are three of those, P38, Junk, and ERK. There's also the kinases that drive those, including MEC. Now, there's been negative studies on all of these, and it, there, but there's there's still uh, still an open question, I think, at least in my mind. Or maybe that's because uh, when things make so much sense, we hate to give them up. But particularly P38 MAP kinase, which is in, very important for the stability and therefore the expression and secretion of TNF-alpha. A lot of negative studies. I think a lot of the negative studies on P38 show us a very important point in the immune system. That is, we forget that the immune system is a balance. And anything that is pro-inflammatory already sets in motion anti-inflammatory aspects. TNF stimulates the, the secretion of interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. It increases the secretion of TNF receptor shedding from the cells. It increases IL-10. All of those are down-regulatory. And one of the things I think that you see with P38 is that P38 also drives subsequent anti-inflammatory factors. This makes sense. This is how the complement works. This is how uh, the clotting cascades work. I don't think we take this into account enough as we think of things. You perturb the system in some way, and it might have untoward effects. A lot of interest in the, the uh, JAK inhibitors. Well, that's great, but JAK stat pathways are also involved in stimulating SOX. Remember the suppressors of cytokine secretion, SOCS. Those are important anti-inflammatory molecules. So the immune system is complex, and as we think of good targets, we have to remember that we still have to do the experiment and see what's going to happen, and I think it's quite reasonable that we can get unexpected results because of the complexity, the, the chaotic nature that these cascades interact with each other. JAK inhibitors heard a lot about this. I won't uh, say too much. Just ex uh, to say, though, that as we talk about specificity, one of the things to remember is that it's probably going to be very hard to be specific for JAK1 or JAK3 because they don't exist as homodimers. Only JAK2 exists as a homodimer. So if you inhibit JAK1, you're probably going to have some effect on JAK3, even if the, the molecule that you had was perfectly, absolutely specific just for JAK1. A lot of argument about what is the best target. Some people would say JAK1, some people say no. You want to have a more broad array. In the talk yesterday, uh, it's almost the talk almost implied that you want to block as many things as possible, but I don't think that's true. And one of the good things about the JAKs is we know what the downside of that is, and that's skid. Remember that that's one of the JAK, one of the things that led to the development of JAKs was the definition of severe, one of the kinds of X-linked severe combined immune deficiency relates to deficiencies in JAK3. And we don't want that. So it's all a question of balance. Uh, another, I, I said they make great slides, though, and there are, di there are a number of inhibitors that are coming, but you heard about this data in the two talks yesterday, and I think it's, it's interesting. We'll just have to see how things, how things sort out. Data with one of the uh, 
upcoming potentially in, uh, JAK inhibitors. Baricitinib, which is more of a 1-2, does show some efficacy. Treat to target. So I, I started to say, uh, not only are we going to talk about new agents, but new concepts. Well, treat to target has been brought to us uh, by the fact that we're able to do better for our patients. And I think it's uh, even trickled down to how we behave in the clinic. Uh, we were now pushing our patients. If they're reluctant to change treatment and say, listen, you still have some swelling. Let's see if we can do better. Now, the, on the flip side of the treat to target is that a lot of the, the justification for this people will use comes from our colleagues in endocrinology, where they'll say, diabetes, got to treat to target. The lower the hemoglobin A1C, the better. It turns out that that's not exactly true, and that there's some studies of that, and they're rethinking this in the care of patients with diabetes and hypertension. Lower is not always better, and I think as we think of our patients, well, of course we want them in remission, but it depends on how aggressively we have to treat them to get them there. And then finally, the last concept, can we discontinue therapy? Very hot item. Unfortunately, it's also, I think, sort of a political issue. And I think governments around the world are very interested in this, if they are the payers, because they would love to say, if you're doing well, stop these treatments which are expensive. Can you do this? There's, ju there's just now emerging studies on this. I was very happy I was involved with Dan Solomon uh, in a, a systematic review that we did of all of the data on discontinuing biologic therapies in RA. Uh, and it was, it was actually very easy. <laughs> part of it was easy because Dan had a fellow who did all the work. Uh, but the other part that was easy is that there's very little data. And the studies are very different from each other in terms of what is a flare or how do you define when something has failed, or at what disease activity level do you discontinue therapy. Joseph Smolin published a preserve study just earlier this year in Lancet, which showed that uh, you can cut the dose of the TNF inhibitor, but it doesn't look like you can stop it. And this is patients with established disease, six plus years of disease uh, duration on average. Uh, and then the uh, Optima study in early rheumatoid arthritis Part, first part of this has been published. The second part uh, deals with whether or not you can discontinue therapy. And as seen presented at the meetings, sort of depends on what, on what you, this, this data you can interpret. This is a glass half full and half empty, as one of the other speakers had said. The ACR20 responses would suggest that in early RA, you can stop a TNF inhibitor for a year and really have no difference. But if you look at the higher levels of response, like the ACR70, then it says that maybe there are people who should have been maintained on their biologic because they would have done better. Time is coming to the end. Let me end with this. As always, as we think about newer therapies, it's about the benefit and the risk. It's, we're always excited about new treatments. They always look great. Uh, and we hope that we can get things that are as good as some of the therapies we've had or even better than that so we continually do better for the patients that we have. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you all for your attention.